Welcome back, colleagues. This is Learn Extra Teacher Talk. Our focus today is on the teaching of physical sciences, and in particular, we are looking at the important topic found in the curriculum section under chemical change. Now, chemical change is summarized in grade 12 in terms of the investigation of the topic of rates of chemical reaction and chemical equilibrium. And research shows us, not only in South Africa, but throughout the world, that learners struggle with these particular concepts. It's a combination of different things that have been pulled together. And if learners aren't very familiar with the basic grounding topics, then they're going to struggle. 
And so we'll go into some detail about what needs to be emphasized and what knowledge needs to be built up from grade 10 through grade 11 to grade 12 so that learners have a consolidated set of knowledge, a framework within, to, within which to work so that they are able to tackle the exam-based questions. And so where do we start when we look at rates of chemical reaction? Well, I believe one of the key ideas that we don't emphasize enough is terminology. And terminology related to the rates of chemical reaction in refers specifically to what is a reactant and what is a product. Now, these are common chemical terms, and it might seem almost superfluous. It might seem unnecessary to mention and reinforce these for grade 12 learners. But you'll be surprised how many learners don't know the difference between reactant and product, and they then make mistakes when it comes to calculations. And so we need to recognize the word that reactant involves the, the substances that are involved at the beginning or at the start of the reaction, the initial things. And the product is the substance that is formed. It's the result of the chemical reaction. Now, in terms of the terminology, the other thing that is important for us to recognize is a related term, which is often used in chemistry, and it's called yield. And the yield simply refers to the amount of product. Now, when we say the amount of product, it means the, the number of moles or the mass or the volume of the product that has been formed. Once learners have this idea that when you react things together, you can predict the amount of product formed, that being the yield, we can talk about a theor theoretical yield and an actual yield. And that would then lead us to an understanding when we deal with it in grade 10 and 11, uh, in terms of the, uh, the quantitative calculations that we do, we can begin to recognize that there might be impurities in a sample. And so yield is an important idea. But what about the word rate? Because learners have a misconception around the word rate, and they're not really sure about what it means. And so I think it's partly because uh, there is general confusion about the word, word rate, and it might come back from when in primary school uh, learners might have been exposed to the idea of distance, time, and rate. They equate rate with speed, um, and in a way that could be a way of interpreting rate, but it's not really the correct way. Uh, so s the synonym for rate is often speed, but if we were to be particular, then we would recognize it's to do with the amount of substance produced, amount of product in a certain time, divided by time. And that's the second concept or the second place that learners get the word rate from. When we talk about power, is the rate of work done. So rate in physics always means divide by time. And so in this case, it talks about the speed or the amount of product, the speed of the reaction, or the amount of product that has been produced in a certain amount of time. So in 10 seconds, how much product has been produced? In, uh, in 20 seconds, how much product has been produced? Is there a relationship with those? Now, uh, in terms of the practical chemistry, um, we need to be able to investigate those. I think there is one further term that we do need to just have a look at, uh, and it's part of terminology or theory that goes with this. The explanation of rate is often explained in terms of collision theory and collision theory uh, links very closely to kinetic theory. So these words or these theories uh, fit under terminology to a certain extent because learners need to understand what's happening. That particles within a reaction mixture, within the substance in the closed container or in the, within the container, they're moving around all the time. 
Uh, that's kinetic theory. But uh, collision theory tells us that the combination of effective collisions, when two molecules bump into each other with sufficient energy, not too much and not too little, they will form a new product. Now, that understanding and the conditions that are required for that is a really important piece of learning that learners need to go through. And they need to be able to talk about it and be able to explain it because those sort of questions come up quite frequently in the exams. Now, the second thing about this section is that it is heavily dependent on investigations um, because the section lends itself so well to a practical investigation. We recognize that there are four factors that affect the rate of any given reaction, and those include temperature, concentration, Uh, the addition of a catalyst and surface area. Now, if we're dealing with gases, I suppose one could recognize that concentration and pressure are related there, if for gases. So um, we can include those as being four factors that can be investigated. Now, What's important in mentioning those four factors is that these factors affect a chemical reaction, but learners need to be able to state the, the scientific process, the method that's involved. And so uh, this is a chance for the examiner to talk about the investigative question. What variables am I uh, considering? And that you would need to have a hypothesis. Remember that learners are going to need to state the hypothesis as a statement of the relationship between the variables. So they might presume and they might assume that from looking at collision theory, that the larger the surface area, the greater the rate of reaction will be, or the more product will be produced in a certain amount of time. They can state that in whatever way they want to. They're comparing a variable, the surface area, and the amount of product produced in a certain time. So there is the comparison. Now it's important that if that were our, our hypothesis, and those were our investigation, what effect does surface area, area have on the rate of reaction? That's the um, investigative question. One would need to control the variables. And we need to have the control of variables as a very clear uh, idea within the teaching of physical sciences. We need learners to understand that you can only deal with an independent variable and a dependent variable. You change the independent variable and as a consequence the dependent variable changes. All the other variables, in this case temperature, concentration, the uh, presence or no presence of a catalyst, the pressure, if it were gases, those things would need to stay the same. It needs to be within a controlled environment. We don't want to have an imbalance. And so be, the reason for that is so that when we look at our results, we can make logical and accurate, valid conclusions. And so that's the importance of learners being able to recognize the importance of a fair test controlling variables. Now in dealing with investigations uh, it almost leads directly on to the idea of graph to, to your results and the interpretation of those results and drawing conclusions and often we're asked to do representations graphic representations of particular rates of reaction. And so I want to suggest to you that learners need to uh, experience the process of going through an investigation. Now, you might say to me, but we don't really have all the equipment necessary to investigate. Uh, well, fortunately, 
uh, there are resources available. And I'd like to show you some of those resources by looking at some video which I've downloaded, and I'm going to show you where to download it first of all. So the first thing to do is to recognize that if you go to the Mindset website and you choose Physical Sciences as a uh, section, so you click on Physical Sciences on the home page, it will open up into these uh, critical areas or core knowledge areas. If you then select uh, chemical change for grades 10 to 12, then you will get to the next section. I've opened it up on another slide, so I want you to see it. Uh, if we go to that one, uh, you will see the grade 10 sessions are highlighted uh, over here, grade 11 over here, and we're looking at rates and chemical equilibrium as our grade 12 topic. Now, if we then click on that, uh, then you will open up a new tab or a new section, and you will find that there are a series of eight videos that you can go to and you can download. Now, the particular one that I'm interested in is this one, measuring rates of re uh, reaction rates. And I've already downloaded that video, so I'm not going to wait for it to download, but I'm going to go straight to the video and uh, make sure that I've got it here on the board. And uh, let's check that we've got the correct one. We're looking at measuring rates. That's correct. And uh, we're going to just open it up, uh, play just a sequence of it. The first thing to, to note, although there's a presenter and you can't hear the presenter at the moment, I just want to show you some of the experimental detail that comes through. And the first section that I'm just pushing towards uh, shows, you a di shows you a bubbling a metal in acid, which I hope you can see over there. And it also showed you a little graphic of what was happening at a microscopic level. So it's important for learners to have that balance. They can see the macroscopic, what's happening on the big picture, what's happening at a molecular level. Now, that's one of the power of video. That's the power of video, the ability to integrate our learning and being able to see it. But the real thing that I wanted to show you, I just must pull along a little bit to another time code. Uh, I want to get to a particular point on this video, um, and we'll get there very soon. Uh, where we're asking for an investigation. And you will see that we've included two learners in this discussion where they go through the process of forming an investigative question, they uh, set up a hypothesis, uh, they identify the independent and dependent variables, and then they carry out the investigation. The investigation is the investigation of sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid, which produces a precipitate of sulfur. That sulfur, when it's put into beakers, uh, turns a yellow-white color. And so uh, there is an interview process between the teacher or the presenter and the learners as they're working in the laboratory. And what, I just want to show you a short clip of what they're setting up. They control the temperature. They're using a stopwatch and uh, they set about doing the investigation. They use the same volumes of solution at different temperatures, and then they're going to measure where the cloudiness of the sulfur precipitate or the, the colloidal mixture suspension of sulfur becomes too dark for them to be able to see a cross that is placed at the bottom of the beaker. So let me just fast forward a little bit. There you can see they're starting to measure out equal volumes of the, of the solution. And so the, the lesson is very carefully structured. They're adding that to each of the beakers or the flasks at least. And at the bottom of the flask, there is a cross so that they can see it. We're going to see the uh, particular section uh, in a minute. They're now cooling down those beakers, one in ice, one in boiling water, and one at room temperature. And there we've got the comparison. So uh, in this case, the investigation was to investigate what effect temperature had 
on the rate of reaction. And you can see in this particular section, the cross is illustrated uh, so that uh, that can be used as a timing device uh, to see where that uh, solution becomes opaque so you can no longer uh, see the cross. As soon as you start pouring the solution in, um, it will start to change its color and uh, at a particular moment in time you'll be able to say, no, I can't see the cross anymore and we're going to go and see exactly that here. They're starting to add the solutions together and watch and see exactly what happens. You'll see the one beaker, the warm beaker has already changed uh, and we'll come back to it in a second. Just move it on a little bit and after a few seconds, the second beaker is going slightly whitish. This one, the one on the right, the hot one, has gone uh, yellow, so bright, and the one on the cold is just turning right now. And so this gives you an opportunity to use the video to interact, much like I've interacted with you describing the reaction. Uh, you could do the same with your learners, asking them to take down the times because if you played the video a little bit further, you would be able to see they tabulate the times. Learners could then interact, not only just see the experiment, watch it, understand what's happening, and be able to interact with it. And, and on top of that, they've then gone through a process to illustrate the investigative process. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is the only thing you do. Uh, video is a powerful representation, um, but there are other investigations that don't need to be dangerous. Um, one could use just simple um, medicine. Uh, we used to, uh, I've done before, uh, some acid-based titrations based on rates of reactions. You can get fizzy tablets that um, you put into a beaker and see, uh, does the size of the particle change um, the color of the indicator and so on. Um, these are all open and I suggest that you explore different ways of representing rates. But in terms of the graphic representation, I think it's important on two accounts that one needs to understand that learners are going to be faced with graphs and they need to be clear about uh, the different axes and they need to be able to interpret what's happening. In terms of a mass versus time graph, this could be where you place a flask on a scale so there's our scale, and you put, place an open beaker or cylinder, put all the reactants inside here, and it's open, and so gases will escape, and what we would recognize is that you're going to get a decrease in mass. And it's important that learners recognize that at the end of a graph like this, that the section here the mass remains constant. The mass doesn't go to zero, but there will be a constant mass, the mass of the beaker and the remaining products. What's happened is the reaction rate is measured as the slope of the graph, and we recognize that over here the graph is very steep. Over here it's less steep, and over here the gradient is almost zero. And so uh, what we're saying is here the reaction is at an end and here it is very fast. Learners need to be able to interpret that. They need to be able to see that that's the one possibility. Um, measuring um, mass in grams and time in seconds could be an option. But that's not the only type of graph that they could get. They need to be able to see a variety of graphs. In the exercise that you give them, I would strongly recommend that you show them not just one type, but if we're dealing with gases, we would deal with volume, volume of gas collected, so of hydrogen gas uh, measured in centimeters cubed, and again, we would have time here. And here the situation or the scenario is that we've got a beaker that's closed, stoppered. It. It's got a sidearm delivery tube, and we are connecting it to a gas syringe. And so the gas syringe over time will change um, as gas bubbles off here. This is a gas syringe. 
we can then measure the volume of gas. What are we going to say the graph will look like? Fairly similar to the one that we've drawn, but it's the other way around. We'd start with no product, and that's the important thing here. The gas is a product. Uh, in this case, the gas was escaping, and we were dealing with what was left over. The gas is a product, so there was no gas to start with, and it slopes that way around. Learners get confused when they see these two different graphs, and it's important that we take them through the process to show what's actually happening so that they've got a very clear picture of the difference between these graphs. Uh, it's important as well to get the idea of what's happening to the rate of reaction in a graph, in a system. So if we've got a particular reaction, and we say A plus B goes to form AB, just very simply, from a graph like this, we can see that the rate of reaction starts off being very high, and it decreases with time, and eventually gets to zero. So if we were to draw a graph of rate, uh, and rate could be um, measured in per second, or mass grams per second, or centimeters cubed per second, um, what we would recognize is that you would start with a rate that is generally quite high, and it would then decrease until it reaches zero. And this is for a straightforward reaction, uh, where A plus B is turned into product. The other type of graph that grade 11s need to know that's related to this is those energy profiles. And I'll just quickly revise those so that you can remind your learners that if we have an energy profile, uh, this being your reactant and this being your product, learners need to recognize the activation energy being the energy required for the reaction to take place and the energy released is that case there. We also need to define and remind learners that the difference between product and, re uh, and the uh, energy of the reactant is known as delta H and in this case delta H is greater than zero because it's an endothermic reaction. Having mentioned that, I also think that it is important that for rates of reaction, learners are aware of the Boltzmann distribution curve, which is not well understood. And the examiner has have said consistently that this is not well understood. We have energy as the one axis and we have the number of particles or molecules as the vertical axis. And what we recognize, it is a, a statistical graph, and we have something like that. And what we're saying is that only these molecules that have enough energy, these ones, that number of molecules, have sufficient energy if that was the activation energy. These ones are not going to react. All of these re molecules, uh, they have energy that is less than the activation energy. And so this reaction would typically be slow. However, if we change the temperature, these graphs are temperature dependent, then we could shift the energy distribution so that more molecules have a greater energy than the activation energy. Well, I hope that illuminates or just summarizes the important things. Now, bear in mind that learners need practice and they need to see these different types of graphs. And so I would recommend that you introduce the sections by highlighting the graphs and summarize the sections at the end of it, saying these are the graphs that you could get um, when we're dealing with rates of chemical reaction. Now, all of this information, although it can be taught very quickly, 
uh, needs to be emphasized, needs to be practiced, but it needs to be imp uh, something that the learners are on top of because the next section on chemical equilibrium is even more important. What they need to know from rates needs to be applied in chemical equilibrium. So let's go and have a look at chemical equilibrium. We're going to do th that directly after the short break. Welcome back colleagues, this is Learn Extra Teacher Talk and our focus today is on physical sciences. And in particular we're looking at the teaching of chemical change. Now this topic is covered in grade 10, grade 11 and grade 12. It's one of those core organizing topics. In grade 12, it's a summative experience of all the stuff that learners have learnt. The difference between a chemical change and a physical change. The difference between a, uh, the energy involved in a reaction. The difference between different types of chemical reactions. We get to grade 12, we're starting to talk about the rate of chemical reaction, how quickly a reaction proceeds, how much product is produced in a certain time, and then the, the, the really interesting but quite difficult concept of chemical equilibrium. Now, uh, this section has been shown by lots of people who have researched both university students, undergraduates, studying chemistry, even studying teaching courses in the sciences, uh, as well as grade 12 learners grade, uh, in other parts of the world as well, uh, sort of end of uh, cycle uh, learners at the upper end of the secondary phase. Um, these learners particularly struggle with the concept of chemical equilibrium. And the question is why is that and how can we unlock the, the teaching of chemical equilibrium? Well, there's a lot of research and there's some current research going on about what are the key identifying necessary bits of PCK, pedagogic content knowledge that will make sure that we teach uh, chemical equilibrium, the concept of chemical equilibrium successfully. Now I want to highlight what I believe are some of those key ideas under PCK. What, we, we might all know the content, we have an understanding of the content, we might know how to teach, but how do we teach this topic? because um, it is a problematic topic. If you look at the exams, you look at the exam report, year after year, we'll find that there are some learners that excel, and then there are a large majority of learners that do very poorly on this section. So it's an area of focus. We find as well in Learn Extra over the last number of years, learners call in, and one of the key things they're asking us is please go over chemical equilibrium. And so, how are we going to correct this misunderstanding or this mis-imbalance in the sharing of knowledge? Well, let's start by looking at what the critical ideas are. I believe one of the first things is, is the idea of a definition. Well, what is chemical equilibrium and how can we clearly define it? And within that process, I want to suggest to you that to define this accurately, we need to refer again to... Um, the idea that in chemistry there are three distinct uh, legs to chemistry. There is the macroscopic, there is the micro, and there is the representation. Now, if we do that for chemical equilibrium, you will find that learners have a much better idea if you signpost it clearly for them. And in, even in the definition, we can break it apart into those uh, ideas. Then we can be quite successful. Learners will achieve a better understanding overall of this topic. So from a macroscopic um, perspective, if we have a closed system, that means we have a certain mass of substance and it's bounded in a container Conditions are constant, same temperature, same pressure. What's happening? What are the processes happening? What will you observe? And at a macroscopic level, you will observe no change. However, at a microscopic level, 
and I, I want to emphasize this, at a microscopic level, you will observe continual change. But what we will notice is that there are changes that are happening as follows, which we can represent in, a di in a, an equation where we say A plus B goes to form AB, but at the same time, AB goes to form uh, A plus B. So this is a reversible reaction, and we're going to say the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse, or the back reaction. Now, to illustrate that, I'm going to select some graphics, uh, animations that we've used in our video series on chemical equilibrium, and I just want to comment on them. So let's first of all go and have a look at these uh, particular uh, systems. Here we have a closed system, and we have particles, in this case representing water in a closed container, and I hope you can see that if I just stop it for a moment, uh, freeze it, what we've got is liquid over here, and we've got gas over here, and the process going from liquid to gas, evaporation, and going from gas to liquid is condensation, at a macroscopic level, nothing's changing. But at a microscopic level, these particles are becoming liquid particles, and liquid particles are becoming gaseous particles. The rate of this change is equal. And so overall, it would appear that there's nothing happening. This is an example of dynamic equilibrium. And so it's important for us to recognize this isn't stationary. There is change at a microscopic level. Now, to illustrate that further, I want to show you what happens in a chemical reaction. This was a phase equilibrium where we had in a closed container, which is easy to illustrate, um, and it's something learners are familiar with. But in terms of a chemical reaction, the similar thing would happen, and here we've got a forward reaction, uh, and what we recognize is those two molecules are meeting each other, and they're forming, as soon as that one forms, another one happens. And so, if we just stop it, we recognize that the rate of the formation of the products is equal to the rate of the separation of those. So the forward is equal to the reverse. And by showing learners a visual picture using video or using animations that simulate what's happening at a microscopic level, even getting them to draw it uh, is powerful. But by, by getting it to move and draw at the same time, it will give them even more of an idea of what's happening. And so I believe that that's really critical to spend some time on laying down the foundations of definition. Then if we look at graphic representation, now there are two forms of graphic representation, and I believe it's important that learners recognize what the variables are. And if we do a rate against time graph, or we can do a concentration against time. And I won't go into the detail of that, but simply to, to recognize that when we're dealing with rate against time, the forward rate starts off very quickly, and the reverse reaction starts off slowly until the rate of the forward is equal to the rate of the reverse. And we can say, at this point, there is chemical equilibrium, where the two have the same rate. The, the, by showing learners the visual representation and then showing them the graph often helps them. But it's difficult to measure the rate. And so what we've got to do is to say practically, rather than monitoring rate, chemists have traditionally monitored the concentration. And so if we have a pr uh, substance, uh, an equation, something like A plus B going to form AB, uh, and they're in chemical equilibrium, and we start with a certain number of moles of A, uh, it will, those moles will decrease, and we start with a different number of moles 
of B, those will decrease. Uh, a, B, there aren't any. And so what we would recognize is they decrease. Uh, but at the same time, as soon as we've got some product form, some of the uh, product starts to be produced. And eventually what we're going to find is we get not the product forming a total amount and the reactants don't decrease to zero, but they decrease to a certain amount. Now, it is confusing because over here we recognize on the rates graph they ended up being the same. In this case, they don't have to always be the same. But what we're saying is the concentration becomes constant. And because the concentration becomes constant, this is a very good way of measuring where equilibrium starts. And so learners need to be aware of looking at the graph and interpreting that as a measure where we have the equilibrium constant, where we say that Kc is a constant at constant temperature. And it's only going to change with temperature, and the definition is very clear. Learners have extreme problems in calculating Kc because of an important fact, and that, I believe, is the understanding of stoichiometry. In the particular graph that I've drawn, I want you to see what the stoichiometry is. Remember, stoichiometry <coughs> tells us about the number of moles reacting. So over here, the ratio is 1 is to 1 is to 1. And on the graph, it's important to note that however much the pink line decreased by, that number, of, that concentration, the green line decreased by the same amount. And the orange line increased by the same amount because it was a one-to-one -one ratio. So ratios are extremely important. And I believe it's important to stress and get learners to work with different ratios um, because they will really struggle if they don't understand ratios. Now, I know that the teaching of KC can become much like a recipe book. And when we're dealing with the, the learners uh, on Learn Extra Live, we teach them the rice table, where rice stands for the ratio, the initial amount, the uh, change, and the equilibrium. We also recognize that this needs to be moles or concentration. And we need to remind learners to always change to uh, concentration at equilibrium so that they can get the correct Kc value. The other thing that's really important is the expression of Kc needs to be unique to the equation given. So it's no good teaching learners that they can write Kc as uh, the concentration of D to the D, C to the C, A to the A, over B to the B. Uh, by learning that, although it's a general form, it's not going to be marked and, and given credit in the exam. They need to take the specific equation and look at that. Well, when we talk about practical demonstrations, that's the final point that I want to make. Uh, we do need to recognize these normally come when we're dealing with Le Chatelier. And just to, to mention, here is a short clip of some learners dealing with cobalt chloride and I'm just going to fast forward that uh, so that we can see them placing the cobalt chloride in different temperatures and watching how the color of the cobalt chloride changes. We really don't have enough time to watch that whole clip because we're running out of time, but I would suggest it's a clip that you could easily use in a classroom situation where if you don't have cobalt chloride and you haven't got a, a solution to show them, then take down the video, make a clip and get them to watch it because they will certainly be amazed at seeing the different types of shifts 
of the position of equilibrium. We need to make sure they understand Le Chatelier and they can apply it to different situations. Well, I hope that summary has helped you. We'll be back uh, next time on some more teaching of chemistry. From me, John, goodbye.